Good evening. How do I sound? Can you turn me down some, please? Echo. Echo. I'll back up, yeah. How's that sound now? Is that all right? All right, well, let's continue our series, Living a Life That Matters. Last week, we, as a, as a brief recap, last week we spoke on the subject of living triumphantly or living victoriously. And uh, what we discussed was that a lot of religious groups will use the term victory in a very, uh, in a very, selfish, uh, in a very selfish way, a very materialistic way, meaning that uh, a lot of religious groups will say it, it, it's directly tied within the health, wealth, and prosperity gospel. If, if something's going on and uh, maybe I want something, the new house, the new car, the new job, the, uh, perhaps it's even health, you know, a family member is sick or, or dying, that all I have to do is to declare victory over the problem, over the issue at hand, and that God will bless me if I just declare victory. And, and what we learned last week was that the New Testament and the Bible as a whole paints a very different picture of victory, and that victory is, is much bigger, but also much more specific than that. It's it's specifically over sin and death that Christ on the cross and in his resurrection was victorious over sin and death once and for all. And that as he says in John that I have overcome the world, that we participate, as 1 John says, in that victory through faith. And we saw that, that, that uniting in, in Romans 6. And we spent some time in Romans 6 talking about how just as Christ died, was buried, and was raised, we too died, was buried, and were raised when we were baptized, and that when we were united with him in a death like his, we were also united with him in, in, in life, to walk in newness of life. And, uh, and that just as Christ's death was sufficient once and for all, he doesn't have to keep coming back, dying year by year, uh, so too our death was sufficient. And... Uh, and then chapter 6, verse 11 says that you, so you must also consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God through Christ Jesus. And that uh, we must, if we want to live a life that matters, if we want to live victoriously, we have to, we have to come to grips and we have to accept what God says about us. That he has declared us righteous, he has declared us perfect, not because of what we've done, but because of what Christ has done, and that we have to accept that, and that we are not just lowly sinners. And, and I understand humility, but we are not just lowly sinners. We are perfect because Christ is perfect, because we are united with him, and that that is what uh, living triumphantly looks like and is foundational to living a life that matters. So uh, per, as Per our custom, I would like to begin with a prayer, and then we'll jump into tonight's subject. Let's pray together. Holy God, we come before you tonight thankful. Um, we are thankful for yet another opportunity to be together and to be able to dig into your word. God, I pray that you bless this time that we may, that we may learn more about you, that we may hear what you want us to hear, and God, I pray that you open our hearts, give us the courage to change in the ways that we need to change, and may we continue to transform into the image of your Son. God, we thank you for your Son, Jesus. We thank you for his example. We thank you for his life, his death, burial, and resurrection, and his ascension to your right hand. And God, may he always be at the forefront of our minds. May he always be our cornerstone and that when we interact with the world around us, that he just transforms the way that we think, the way that we talk to our families and to others around us and the way that we act. God, may he be the motivating factor in living a life that matters. In Christ's name that we pray. Amen. So tonight I wanted to 
introduce our subject by asking you a question. What do you do when you don't know what to do? Let me ask that again. What is it that you do when you come to a moment in your life that you don't know what to do? If you would, uh, take your Bibles and open up to Proverbs chapter 3. Proverbs chapter 3. We're going to re- read verses 1 through 8 together. So if you would flip over there and read with me. I don't have it on the screen. Starting in verse 1. My son, do not forget my teaching, but let your heart keep my commandments. For length of days and years of life and peace they will add to you. Let not steadfast love and faithfulness forsake you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart, so you will find favor and good success in the sight of God and man. And then verse 5, he says this, Trust in the Lord with all of your heart, and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge Him, and He will make straight your paths. Be not wise in your eyes, in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. It will be healing to your flesh and refreshment to your bones. So this proverb, specifically in verses 5 and 6, encourage us to trust in the Lord with all of our hearts and to not lean on our own understanding. The subject for tonight is living trustfully. In those times, in those moments when you just don't know what to do. Maybe it's uh, during a a sickness or a death in the family. Maybe it's uh, a difficult decision in front of you that will affect uh, your family and or your future. Uh, Maybe it's overwhelming and habitual temptation and, and sin. But whatever it is. When you just don't know what to do, what do you do? Well, according to this passage in verse 5, it says that we must live trustfully. Living trustfully, what does that even mean? What does that look like? Isn't that just a little cliche? I mean, yeah, sure, just trust God. But, But how? How do you do that? What does that even look like when that crossroad comes before you? And I'm I'm sure you've heard this before, right? When when you come to a difficult or or particularly particularly difficult time in your life and you just don't know what to do, and uh, someone here with sincere and genuine motivation says, well, just just trust God. Okay, thanks. I got it. Trust God. All right. But, but how do you do that? And what does that look like? Because trusting God is necessary for our walk. It's necessary for our spiritual journey. And it's not just a cliche statement. So, so how, do we, how, do we, how do we keep this from being just one of those cliche statements that, that Christians say to each other in passing without really digging deep into the situation at hand. So first what I want to do is I want to look a little closer at this section that we just read, specifically verses 5 and 6. In verse 5, he begins by saying, Trust in the Lord with all of your heart. So for Solomon, the first step is in handling life circumstances is to put the problem into someone who has bigger hands than you do. Trusting God. If you ask any of the faithful men and women in the Old Testament, any of the people in in Hebrews chapter 11 that we consider the great hall of faith, they would tell you to trust God. Because for them, trusting God was not a cliche concept. 
It was vital for them to be able to move forward in their faith. Trusting God was foundational for them. I mean, just look at David's life. Look at the Psalms, right? So when you read through the Psalms, in one Psalm you, you see him say very strong words like, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He leads me by green pastures. He leads me by still waters. He restores my soul. And then the next Psalm he says, why has my God abandoned my soul to Hades? Okay, so you see a roller coaster of faith, and you see someone who, who struggles with trusting God at times, many times. And he, he'd, be the first one, he'd be the first one to tell you that he struggles with trusting God. If you would flip over to Psalm, keep your finger here in Proverbs. We'll be right back. But Psalms chapter 73, if you would flip over there, please. Psalm 73. I'm going to read verses 20 through, 22 through 24. I was brutish and ignorant. I was like a beast towards you. Nevertheless, I am continually with you. You hold my right hand. You guide me with your counsel. And afterward, you will receive me to glory. So at times he admits that I, I was senseless, I was ignorant, I was like a beast before you. I, I just. But then he he also recognizes that. That God he he affirms the eternal truth that God will be continually with us. That if we trust Him, that His counsel will lead us to glory, and at no point in the journey will God abandon us. So Sol Solomon in Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5 says to trust in the Lord with all of your heart. And then he, he continues and says, and do not lean on your own understanding. If you would flip over to the book of Job. Book of Job. We'll be in chapter 4 in just a second. Job 4. So in, in the book of Job, you, you see a man who really struggles with trying to use human reasoning to understand what's going on in his surroundings. Um, and you also see this in Job's friends. I, I like to tell people that that Job had some of the best friends in the world for the first seven days. Because it was the first seven days, they just sat with him and they mourned with him. And, but then they opened their mouth and uh, they gave him bad counsel. And you see this in all three of his friends. Job 4, 7 through 8. Eliphaz says, Remember who that was innocent? I said, remember, who that, who that was innocent ever perished? Or where were the upright cut off? As I have seen, those who plow iniquity and sow trouble reap the same. Bildad echoes this in chapter 8. Chapter 8, verse 20. Behold, God will not reject a blameless man, nor take the hand of evildoers. And then Zophar says this also in chapter 11. Job 11, 14 through 15, and then in 17. If iniquity is in your hand, put it far away. And let not injustice dwell in your tents. Surely then you will lift up your face without blemish. You will be secure and will not fear. Verse 17, and your life will be brighter than the noonday. See, all these friends, they display a syllogistic thought process. See, syllogism is the, is the uh, concept that a conclusion is drawn from two assumed propositions. All right, so for, for Job's friends, this is their assumption, okay? 
God sends calamities upon the wicked people only. All right? You have suffered a calamity, Job. So, therefore, you must be wicked. And you see this in all his friends the whole time. God only punishes the wicked. You've, you've been punished, so therefore you're wicked. And uh, so they keep asking Job, repent from what you've done, repent from what you've done. And Job says, I have nothing to repent of. You see, this is what happens when you rely on your own understanding to with your limited perspective, your limited senses, what you see, what you hear, what you can touch, you, you come to a conclusion and then end up not having all the necessary facts in front of you. And this is not to say that we should not think. God does not want us to just not think and just follow him blindly, but this is to say that we should lean on the one who has a greater perspective, a greater understanding. Do not lean on your own understanding. Job makes this evident himself. Okay, So after an entire di- book of dialogue between Job and his friends, God speaks directly to Job in Job 38. we we'll go back over to Job 38. So after all this dialogue... God speaks out of the storm and says in verse 1, sorry, in verse uh, 2 and 3. I'm in Psalm 38. That makes no sense. Okay. (laughs) I was confused. Job 38. Verse 1 says, Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, and then verse 2, Who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Dress for action like a man. I will question you, and you make it known to me. It's pretty intense. And then he spends the next couple of chapters just going on and on about, I'm God, you're not, the end. That's basically, if you want to sum up chapter 38, 39, 40, I'm God. Where were you when this happened, when this happened, when I created this, when I did this, when I created, where were you? And then you see Job respond humbly in chapter 42. Job 42, 1 through 3. He he quotes what we just read. He quotes God and responds to that statement. Then Job answered the Lord and said, I know that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. And he quotes God. Who is this that hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore I have uttered what I did not understand, things too wonderful for me, which I did not know. Job recognizes that his understanding is limited and that God's understanding is greater and has a full concept of the situation. So all that to be said, when we come to a crossroad, okay, so when we, in in our spiritual journey, in our spiritual walk, when we come to a crossroad, when we come to that valley or perhaps even that dead end, and we just don't know what to do. And we ask, our, we ask ourselves things like, why? Why did this happen to me? What did I do to deserve this? I, I just don't understand. Perhaps, I would put forth that perhaps one of the most important aspects of living trustfully is not seeking to understand the situation, but seeking to lean on God's understanding. And what I mean by that is, if God responded to Job, instead of what we see in Job 38 through 42 of of God saying, I'm God, you're not, rely on me, don't rely on yourself. If instead, Job, he, he answers Job and he gives him all the answers that he wanted. All the stuff that we know from the first few chapters of Job, okay? Uh, you know, there's this conversation between Satan and God, and, this, and, and then this, all this happens to Job, stuff that Job doesn't know. If he gave him all that insight and all that knowledge, okay, if he enlightened him to what we know about the first few chapters, it would defeat the entire purpose. If God gave Job all the answers, Job wouldn't need God. 
he could then just lean on his own knowledge, his own understanding of this situation. Oh, okay, I understand. This happened, this happened. Okay, so we're, um, okay, I have faith in, in that. Not, but instead of having faith in, in God and trust in God. And I think this is, this is very relevant to us because one of the most difficult subjects for the Christian, and, and all of you have come in, in, in a contact with this with, with friends and family and, and with yourselves at times, is why do bad things happen to good people? Right? Why, why, why is there suffering in the world? And perhaps what we could learn from Job is that we don't necessarily need an answer. We need to lean on the one who has complete understanding. And that's hard. Living trustfully is hard. It's not an easy concept. It's not something that, that comes naturally. You, you know, you day one in your faith and boom, I just complete. It is something that is learned. It is something that you, that you go through, that you grow in, right? But you see that what you see in Job, Job doesn't get all the answers. Even at the end of the book, he doesn't have all the answers of why this happened. And I think that that is because if he did have all the answers, it would defeat the whole purpose of God, of, of, of Job trusting fully and relying fully in God and who God is and God's understanding and, and, and God's love for him and that God wants what is best for him, even though what I can perceive doesn't necessarily lead me to that conclusion. How, how can God love me if this happened and if this happened and if, and if this happened? Over, how can God... Living trustfully is hard. But we are not just to trust, but we are to lean on His understanding. Do not lean on your own understanding. So back in Proverbs 3, Trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Do not lean on your own understanding. And in all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will make straight your paths. So finally, we, get, we learn from this, pre, from this passage that we should, in all of our ways, acknowledge him. And, and this is a very straightforward truth. There's not a lot to unpack here. Um, but we are to acknowledge him in all of our ways. Not in some of our ways but in all of our ways, meaning God should make up the entirety of our life. If you would flip over to Colossians chapter 3. Colossians 3. This is a common passage, but I, I want us to read it together anyway, just so that we remain familiar with our Bibles. Colossians 3, verses 23 through 24. Whatever you do, work heartily, as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ. So that acknowledging him in all of our ways, as Solomon says in Proverbs chapter 3, acknowledging him in all of our ways means that whatever we do in word or deed, whatever we do, we must do it as for God and not for men. We must acknowledge him in all of our ways. It makes up who we are, the way that we talk, think, and act, whether we're alone, with family, at church, at work, etc. You've heard this example many times, I'm sure, but imagine if you were with your spouse or another really close loved one as frequently as you were with God. If the only times you talked to your spouse was Sunday morning, Sunday night, maybe Wednesday night if you're not too tired, and, and perhaps around meals if you're not too hungry, okay? Um, perhaps, what if you were with your spouse as much as you were with God? If the only times you talked to your spouse was Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, how would your relationship be? How would it affect you? And this, this is the same with God. When we only acknowledge God a few times a week, okay, this is important, when we only acknowledge God a few times a week and that crossroad or dead end or that valley comes, 
unexpectedly from, from left field, when all of a sudden just life comes hurtling in over you? And when you don't have that healthy relationship to fall back on, you can't trust God if you don't have a relationship with him. This is something, so for Solomon, trusting God is not just leaning on on his understanding and not your own, but it, 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 is, it is part of it, acknowledging him in, in all of your ways is, is your, the entirety of your life acknowledging him in the way that you speak, the way that you act, continually to pray to him, continue to talk with him, continue to read your scripture because that foundation has to be laid, that context has to exist for you to be able to trust God in the storm, Okay. Jesus, at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, um, uses the illustration of the wise man building his house upon the rock, right? The wise man builds his house upon the rock. The foolish man builds his house upon the sand. But what's important to gather from that passage is that it doesn't matter if you build your house on the rock or if you build your house on the sand. The storm's going to come either way, right? The storm's going to come. It's not, it's not about... Like we talked last week, this, this, this whole prosperity, health, wealth gospel, it's not about if you build your house on the rock, everything's going to be fine. There's going to be sunshine and rainbows. The storm's going to come. Life's going to come. You're going to come to that crossroad. You're going to come to that dead end and that valley. Where is your foundation going to be? It's about creating that foundation, the Christ being the only source that can keep you stable through the storm because it's going to come either way. So acknowledging him in all of your ways is that laying of the foundation. It is that, that building on a rock. It is that building on Christ. Continually pointing in everything that you do, think or say, towards God, towards Christ, so that you can deepen that relationship with him. If you would, I would like you to turn over to Hebrews chapter 11. Uh, I want to re- re- re-emphasize a point that I made when we studied Hebrews in the fall, at the beginning of chapter 11. Hebrews 11 says uh, in verse 1 and 2, Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. For by it the people of old received their commendation. The Hebrews author uses the idea of faith in Hebrews 11, I would say, differently than Paul uses the idea of faith in a lot of his letters. And what I mean by that is, in most of the letters, when, when the word faith is used, it is used in a very indiv- indiv- individual and personal way. I'm putting faith in God's grace. You know, Ephesians 2 says we are saved by grace through faith. So faith is me putting faith in what Christ has done and his salvific power on the cross and his ability to save me. It's very personal. But in Hebrews, I would say, and this is not an either or, this is just kind of a broader lens, a broader perspective on faith. And for Hebrews, um, the Hebrews author, faith is, is much, much bigger uh, faith, I would say, is for him is synonymous with, with trust. Uh, when I don't necessarily see the outcome, but I'm going to move forward anyway. It, it, it's talk. It's very uh, personal to, and, and you see that in each of the, uh, the men and women listed in Hebrews chapter 11, where where something, a point comes in their life where they have to make a decision that they don't necessarily, they can't fully comprehend what's going on. But I'm going, to make, I'm going to trust God anyway. For them, that's faith in the assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things not seen. Um, it's trusting in something that I can't see. It's believing God when he promises to do something because he said that I will do it. Even if I don't understand how that outcome will come to be. And verse 2 says that the people of old received their commendation by this type of faith, okay? And so you see this throughout the whole Old Testament. Abraham was told to leave Ur, even though he didn't know where he was going to go. If you read that, he says, 
pack your bags and get out of town. That's, that's about it. And he later learns where he's going, but at first he doesn't know where he's going. Abraham was told that he would receive descendants that would match the stars in the sky, but he was barren and Sarah was barren. Uh, how's this going to happen, God? Uh, he, Abraham was told to sacrifice Isaac, even though Abraham was promised that, no, don't, don't try to go around this promise. Isaac will be the one that the previous promise is fulfilled through. Your descendants will come through Isaac. And then he's told to sacrifice Isaac, even though he knows that Isaac is the one who, who God said will be the vessel in which the descendants are to come. And later in Hebrews 11, it says that he even considered that God would raise him from the dead. He had every intention to sacrifice Isaac, even though he had no way to perceive how God was going to fulfill his promise. But he didn't need that understanding. Joseph had to trust God when he was in slavery. Moses had to trust God with his speech impediment and timidity. David had to trust God when he was dealing with the consequences of his own sin. Daniel had to trust God when he was in a den of hungry lions. And of course, Jesus had to trust God when he didn't want to go to the cross, but decided to go anyway. Jesus shows us how to lean on the one with a greater understanding. So let me, let me end where we began. What do you do when you don't know what to do? This is what I can tell you. You, you trust God. You live trustfully. How do you do that? That, I don't think I have the ability to tell you. I mean, sure, we're supposed to trust God. We're supposed to not lean on our own understanding. We're supposed to acknowledge Him in all of our ways. But at the end of the day, trusting God comes through experience. There is nothing that I can say that will adequately prepare you for that crossroad. And if we're going to be honest here, and as I... As I look at the faces looking back at me, I see many individuals who are much farther along in this journey than I am. I see a lot of faces who have, who have been there and done that when it comes to living a hard life and being at a point where I just got to trust. And I don't know how, I don't know how I'm going to get through this. I don't, I don't know, I, I, but I'm going to trust God. I'm going to live a life that is full of trust. I mean, maybe you should be up here teaching me. You see, trusting God is intrinsically woven within a relationship with God. A relationship that through years of good times and bad times, happy times and sad times, it just continually deepens and deepens. And, and as Paul says in Philippians, to work out your salvation with fear and trembling, not to work to obtain it, but the salvation that you've received by grace through faith, you, you, you work out just like you would work out a farm. You work to obtain the most you can from that free gift of salvation. You don't go halfway with God. You deepen that relationship. You lay that foundation so that when the storm comes, you can trust that's something that's learned through experience. There is one thing I do want to say about it, and, uh, and what I want to do is I want to correct, perhaps, in, in my opinion, a, a false statement that I hear repeated regularly. I hear people say, God will not give me more than I can bear. That is not true. And now, of course, 1 Corinthians 10, 13, and we used this scripture last week, says we will not be tempted more than we can handle. And that is for sure. That is a promise. But to say that God will not give me more than I can bear is not true. A correct understanding should be God will not give me more than I can bear alone. You see, God never intended us to make it through this life alone. Certainly not without him but also not without each other. 
I mean, isn't that the whole point of church? I mean, isn't that why we get together? We're told to not neglect the assembly in Hebrews chapter chapter 10. But isn't the whole point of not neglecting the assembly because we are to stir one another up to love and good works? Isn't the whole point of church mourning with those who mourn and rejoicing with those who rejoice? You see, we're not supposed to make it through this all by ourselves. And maybe it's just the individ- this, I can't say the word, individualistic, there it is, culture that we live within as Americans. But we're not supposed to make it alone. Certainly not without God. But we're not supposed to do this without each other. We're supposed to be around like-minded people who are mourn when we're mourning and rejoice when we're rejoicing. Galatians 6 2 says that we are to bear one another's burdens. We're not supposed to do this alone. God will not give you more than you can bear with his help and with the church's help. So what do we do when we don't know what to do? We trust God. We lean on his understanding. We acknowledge him in all of our ways. And how do we do these things? That, my friends, is up to you to figure out on your own. Trusting God comes through experience and through relationship. Thank you for your attention.